and welcome to the Keeper of the Home podcast. I am Cami, creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Tidbits and Company. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Now, so much of our work is often referred to as being called mundane. But doesn't that word just sound like drudgery? <laughs> is that really how we want to feel about our important day-to-day -day work as keepers of the home? Now, even if our work is repetitive and perhaps not always glorified, it is still vital to the success of our home and it is, in fact, very exalting work. So let's use a different word than mundane, and I think I have a suggestion for you. So hang tight and let's see if one simple word swap can change your entire outlook on homemaking like it did for me. So I think this is going to end up being a shorter podcast episode. So let's call it a quick homemaking hack, if you will. Now I do have a couple of housekeeping items to share with you. Because it is Emergency Preparedness Awareness Month, which I love when that rolls around every September, I actually really get into this because it's a very good reminder to think about if we are prepared for emergencies. And I really want to just trickle in some encouragement this month through my podcast to just give you ideas of maybe something little that you can do to um, improve your emergency preparedness. Now, I think this Awareness Month landing in September is just the perfect timing for this because winter is coming and I think we all have that kind of nesting instinct, but also, you know, if things go bad in the winter, <laughs> I mean, it's not very pleasant to think about, but, you know, if we lose power, water, have to evacuate, it's just hard to fathom these kind of disasters that might happen in the winter time because that cold is just going to make things harder. So I think it's very important to just look through your house, make sure you're prepared for those kind of situations. Um, if, you know, winter's here and make sure that you have enough stock. If like stores shut down, would you be able to get, get by? If the roads were closed for weeks, would you be able to get by? So it's just a really good time here in September to think a little bit about being more prepared. Something that we really like to do, usually in September and October, is we take a look at our pantry, our food storage, and get really thoughtful about what we need to stock up on. And this is a usually when I make a really big Azure Standard order. Um, I have talked about them frequently. I love Azure Standard. I love their organic products that come in bulk at a great price. So definitely check them out. I'll leave a link below for you to check out Azure Standard. And you just need to put in your zip code and it'll tell you if there's a drop near you because it is a delivery service. It's kind of a co-op thing where people kind of share the shipping costs. Anyway, I do have a YouTube video <laughs> that explains all that, but we like to really stock, stock up on some of our bulk foods. And one of those foods is wheat berries. I really try to have almost a year supply of wheat berries in our house at all times. And then I have to be very mindful about cooking with those wheat berries. So wheat berries are great to store instead of flour that's already ground. Even if you're buying whole wheat flour that's already ground up, it is not going to last very long. It's going to go rancid fast. Whereas if you buy the wheat berries, they're not only cheaper, but they will last usually up to like 20 years. So it's a great investment to buy wheat berries in bulk. I get a lot of mine from Azure Standard. There's also a local mill here in our area where I get just like the hard red or white wheats in the berry form. But Azure Standard has a lot of the einkorn and the spelt that I love to get. Oh, and I should mention, um, I will leave a coupon code for Azure Standard if you want to save some percentage off your cart because I keep my eyes out for those when they get out new ones. So I will try to keep the description updated with the newest coupon code for you. But as far as like wondering how much wheat you should store in your house, I've read in several places that about 150 pounds per person per year. And if you have any kids that are eight and younger, you can cut that in half. So anyway, check out your food storage, see if maybe you can get some more of that, stock up on that. Um, if you want to know how I use wheat berries, 
I have a YouTube video about the kitchen appliances that I love, and there's a wheat grinder that I recommend in there. It's the Nutramil, love that one. Along the same topic of long-term food storage, I also try to keep at least three to six months worth of like the oils that we love to cook with, because I can't imagine trying to survive with just wheat alone. <laughs> so I like to keep um, gallon buckets of coconut oil, and then we also use olive oil a lot. So those do go rancid faster. So keeping about three to six months of what you would typically use stored up in your house is another important one. Now, I could go on, I haven't really done any blog posts about this at all, but I'm just trying to get you thinking about food storage and maybe how you might need to check in and evaluate what you have. Now, equally as important is being prepared for emergency evacuation situations. I think we've seen in the world a lot lately um, the need for evacuations. So for me, that's one of the top things that I um, do as a family to get all of us 72 hour kits and emergency grab and go bags, pet emergency kits and stuff like that compiled. And if you're overwhelmed by that, please check out my emergency evacuation preparedness class over at my Tidbits and Company shop page. Just go to tidbitsandcompany.com, click over to my shop and you'll see the menu for classes. Um, it's a great class to just step you through, help you know what to buy, give you a printable checklist and everything so that you can get prepared for emergency evacuations. Probably, I think, one of the most important things we need to do as keepers of our homes. Okay, my friend, let's talk about the topic at hand. Now, there have been more times in my life than I can count where I have called my work mundane. <laughs> let's talk about examples. So the dishes always dishes multiple times a day. <laughs> when my kids whine, I just say, you know what? Dishes is about the only constant in life. <laughs> always, always dishes to be done and, and it can feel very mundane. I'm sure you can relate. Laundry is a task that comes up week after week, day after day. Cleaning a space, we get it clean and then it gets dirty just as quick it seems sometimes and we have to clean it again and again fluffing the pillows on the couch that the kids throw on the floor, <laughs> driving the kids to and fro, making the beds, feeding the sourdough, making dinner, making lunch, making breakfast, more dishes, more food, more dishes. <laughs> I think you get the point. But that sounds like the work of a homemaker. And I'm not sure that there's much we can do to avoid that stuff, whether we have families living with us, friends, or by ourselves. This stuff is a constant in our life because of the nature of living. So like I said, there have been many times in my life where I have looked at this work as being so mundane, so repetitive, and it just, it, at times it can feel really difficult or life-sucking. It really can. I'm not going to ignore that or sugarcoat it. That is sometimes a reality. And um, sometimes we may feel those feelings more than others. But please let me know in the comments if you can relate, or maybe it's just me, I don't know. But my guess is that many of us at times feel that way about our day-to-day -day work. Now, I was helping a kiddo one day with homeschool and um, it, just, it just sparked a thought in me. <laughs> Unbeknownst to me, I had a thought that basically changed my outlook on this. So we were learning a new concept for this child and um, to put it nicely, she was falling apart <laughs> because it was difficult. Um, what we were learning was extremely unfamiliar, but she kept using the word, this is too hard, this is too hard. And I said, it's not actually hard, it's just unfamiliar. So once we make it familiar, you're actually going to love doing it. And my own wisdom, <laughs> if you will, it really made me stop and think about that word that I used, familiar. And it made me start noticing other areas of life where this would come up. And I noticed how more familiar work is actually done with more ease and oftentimes with more joy. So, I mean, you can compare it to like if you're in a store 
and you see a familiar face, what does that instantly do? Unless maybe you don't like the person, I guess. <laughs> but for me, if I like run into a family member or a friend, it brings me joy because that face amongst the sea of other faces is familiar and it brings me joy. Here's another example. So I, I'm trying to get my kids more exposed to like classical music, you know like the real old classics, Beethoven, Bach, and all that, all that good stuff that honestly I'm trying to familiarize myself with. But if I try to put that on and they've never heard it before and there's just nothing relatable about this style of music, the kids don't grab it very easily. Now it takes playing it multiple times and then it starts to click and then they can start to hum along or they recognize it. And that familiarity brings more joy to the song. However, I compare that to um, like we like to listen to the piano guys and they often take familiar pop songs and make it into beautiful classical music and I can turn that on and even though my kids have never heard that particular song, the song is familiar and so they they immediately find joy and um, relate to it. This also goes if we like hear a story or maybe um, if a scripture story finally becomes familiar to you, that's when like the next time you hear it, it takes on new meaning and new depth and it can be more enjoyable to talk about that story. This also happened when um, recently, so my husband is kind of starting this new sauna building business. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> I'll keep you guys um, updated, but so far it's going okay. And He's been making a bunch of them, but the, like the first couple times of building these saunas were really hard and they took a long time because he was trying to figure it out. You know, he was unfamiliar with the method and the process and it was hard and maybe even a little discouraging. But once he got all that down and the process became familiar, he could go faster and he enjoyed it. He could kind of relax about the process and just let his hands go and maybe put in a book, an audio book, and listen to it while he worked and it just became more enjoyable. So anyway, I began to recognize this concept of familiar equaling maybe more joy. <laughs> and I had a bit of a moment of breakthrough when I finally kind of clued it into my work as a homemaker. So one day I, I kind of pushed myself, I guess I didn't have to, but I needed to get out I needed to film three YouTube videos in one day, and that is hard. <laughs> and, um, but it just had to happen. We had things going on and I needed to get ahead. And anyway, I'm just like, I have to film at least three videos in one day. And doing that, like each time I film a YouTube video, I'm figuring stuff out. It's unfamiliar territory for every video. And it's just, it's just a lot to think about. And it's a lot to um, work through. And so that day that I did three of those videos like that, my, my brain was mush, I was exhausted, and I felt like it was so taxing on my mind to try to bring out that much creativity in one day. And so when all that was over and the end of the day came, I started about my work of making dinner, doing the dishes, and I kind of found myself washing dishes and breathing this sigh of relief, noting to myself that I was relieved to finally be doing the familiar work of my day. Where other times I may have thought, oh, now I have to go and do the mundane work. When I use that word familiar, everything changed. <laughs> and all of a sudden I found myself in this rhythm of feeling really grateful for the familiar work that I got to do with my hands and get to do every day as a homemaker. So I think it is great when we challenge ourselves and we push ourselves and we push our creativity and we do unfamiliar things. I'm not saying those things are not great. They're great, they're a part of our lives no matter how we try <laughs> to not work too hard. We will always be faced with things in our lives that are unfamiliar and we need to learn them and kind of get over that learning curve or that hump of difficulty. And that is good because it kind of releases these feel good hormones or these endorphins when we've accomplished this task and overcame something and we can feel satisfaction and um, really proud of our work. But it's also helpful to think of the more repetitive work that we do 
can actually be rest to our souls, especially when some of our day has been filled with some of the harder things. And we can feel that rest because the work is familiar. We know what we're doing. We've done it a million times. Um, a lot of these things, these tasks that we do as keepers of our home, they're really dependable. It's just like the rising and setting sun there will always be dishes to be done, <laughs> Lord willing, right? And what a gift that so much of our work is familiar because while we are doing those tasks, it actually frees up some brain space and maybe some space for communication. You might be able to do your work while talking and connecting with your kids or your spouse. You may even get to watch a show. My mom actually loved doing laundry all in one day. I think it was Wednesdays. And that's what she did for the entire day. And she thoroughly enjoyed it because that's when she watched some TV <laughs> and allowed herself to do that because she was also about a very important familiar work of doing laundry. Doing familiar work gives you an opportunity to listen to your favorite podcasts. I don't know about you, but I am a podcast junkie. I'm guessing you enjoy some of them since you're listening to this, but I love to just find those moments in my day where I can maybe learn something while I'm doing something else. It's almost like passive learning or inspiration. It's great that our work kind of allows us space to do that, to inspire and educate ourselves. Doing familiar work gives you an opportunity to just turn on some beautiful music that can relax your soul or maybe even pump you up should you need that. Um, but actually, I think doing familiar work gives us an amazing opportunity to just enjoy the silence and our quiet thoughts because we need that processing time and it's just wonderful that we can do that. Also, while keeping our hands busy, being productive and getting the things done that are really important to running a household. So I saw this like viral TikTok. It was super controversial, <laughs> obviously, which is why it did so well. But there was a young woman who was obviously like being proposed to and about to put on this ring. And her imagination was led to this portrayal of a woman that was basically enslaved, that she was stuck at home doing the dishes, the laundry, the mopping, barefoot and pregnant and just miserable. And I watched this TikTok and I was just, well, actually, I, I'm not on TikTok, but I watched it on Instagram. <laughs> Someone shared it, but anyway, um, I was just so sad by this portrayal of the work of a homemaker, that it was, that it was demeaning, mundane, um, it was repetitive, monotonous, and just filled with that drudgery and disrespect. It really, really bothered me. <laughs> and it just made me so sad because if we're looking at our work that way, um, there's a whole bunch of things I could say about that. You know? <laughs> why does marriage equal, or why is getting married the only reason why you would do laundry and dishes? Anyway, anyway, I won't go into that, but how sad if that is our perspective of our work in the home, that is going to be a surefire way to hate your life and your job and be ungrateful for what you have. So be really, really careful about that mindset um, about um, the work of a homemaker. And so when we switch the words mundane, monotonous, drudgery, if we instead use the word familiar, there are some things that can happen. And in my mind, we gain more comfort about what we're doing. We can feel at more peace because we feel at ease with what we're doing. There's room in our hearts and our minds to be appreciative for the work that we get to do. We may even see the beauty in it and see the opportunities for creativity. And it's just going to become overall more enjoyable and more fulfilling. And I just want to say, if this little homemaking hack should cease to work for you, <laughs> maybe you could find new ways to spruce it up. Put some flowers on the table that you might not normally do. Maybe switch out your routine. Maybe you're feeling really burdened and that's why this familiar work feels so heavy. Try to enlist some help. Maybe you need to get reorganized or rethink the processes in your home so that your work can actually become easier and more familiar and that might actually make it more enjoyable. So anyway, my friend, 
try it out. Try using the word familiar to define your work and let's see if it helps. I would love to know if you want to reach out to me in the comments below on my video podcast on YouTube, leave me a review, get in touch with me on Instagram at Tidbits and Company, and let me know what you think about this concept, if it helps, if you think it will help, or maybe you've got another idea for us, another homemaking hack. I would love to hear it and love to share it with our community of keepers of the homes. May you find so much joy and fulfillment in the familiar work that fills your days. Thank you so much for being here with me today, and I will be back very soon to share more inspiration for the keeper of the home.